Well, I would like to welcome our studio audience and anyone that we have viewing us online uh, to this webinar in Issues in Family Health Communication. Our focus today is Augmentative and Alternative Communication for Children with Autism. Uh, my name is Brooke hildebrand Clubs. I teach for the Department of Communication Studies. I teach fundamentals of oral communication, intercultural communication, and I'm finishing my Master of Science degree in health communication. So I'll be teaching that uh, soon as well. We're here at Southeast Missouri State University, and we are pleased to welcome uh, Krista Davidson. She is a speech pathologist who got her master's degree from Purdue University. She also did some postgraduate work at Purdue with Dr. Lyle Lloyd, who is one of the founders of AAC. She is the Augmentative and Alternative Communication Specialist for the Belleville Area Special Services Cooperative. She engages in direct therapy as well as consultation for a 24 district cooperative. And in the interest of full disclosure, Krista is also my sister. <laughs> so I'm pleased to welcome Krista Davidson. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. All right. What we're going to uh, do is we're going to kind of cover some issues regarding AAC, the history of AAC, and then we're going to move into focusing specifically how it deals um, with children that have autism. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. So first, Krista, can you give us a little bit of the timeline of AAC development? Sure. Um, well, families and individuals have always been using some form of AAC, usually um, some manual signs. Um, we can even remember with our grandparents who had several um, deaf brothers and sisters that they had their own set of signs that they used to communicate with each other. Um, but the field of AAC really emerged in the 1950s and 60s. And then you can see by all these different um, acts, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act and so on, that um, with each of these successively AAC became um, more prevalent and included more in, um, in these acts, uh, especially the amendments that were made in 1997, they specifically targeted AAC. So um, it has a, a relatively brief history, I guess, in, in the whole scheme of things. Right. Um, but to me it seems, you know, like, goes back to before I was born, so um, there's a whole other timeline that we could talk about too, uh, and that's the invention of the computer, because as computers became more widely available um, and got smaller and more affordable, they became integrated into communication devices, and then those became available to people who needed them. Um, and then the biggest uh, revolution in AAC that I've seen so soon in my career is um, the invention of the iPad in 2010. And that has really um, changed the scene in, in augmentative communication. Um, however, I see it as both uh, a pro and a con. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people see it as sort of a panacea. And um, I think that if you look at it in a uh, systematic way, you'll see that it, it's not right for all kids. Um, and it's, it's definitely more socially acceptable and it's mm -hmm. more affordable. Um, and a lot of people feel more comfortable using that kind of technology. Right. Um, however, you have to look at what fits the child best. And um, not all apps are created equal. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked about you know, apps that are created by speech pathologists and have a lot of research base versus apps that might be created by some guy in his basement and <laughs> you know, it's just four pictures. And, but they might be advertised the same way on iTunes. And, mm -hmm. um, so you really, um, you still need a, an evaluation and you need an SLP, I think, to be involved in, in the decision-making process when it comes to uh, iPads and apps. So you can't say, hey, why get this $1,000 device when I could get a $1.99 app, right? Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, you kind of get what you pay for right? <laughs> when it comes um, to the apps. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the timeline um, uh, when it comes to AC. Okay, great. Now you mentioned the importance of you know choosing the device that's right for the child that's meeting you know the people's needs. So let's talk a little bit about uh, who are the best candidates for AAC. Okay. Well, and then I have to um, of course say that there are no prerequisites for AAC. Um, so I think that 
anyone who has little to no functional speech is a candidate um, for AAC. And as I'll talk about later, even some students who have some oral verbal speech could still um, be an AAC user. Um, and that AAC doesn't equal a device per se, that, that it includes low tech and no tech solutions as well. Um, a lot of individuals think that, that it's synonymous with a, a high tech device, and it isn't. Um, did you want me to mention PECSIT? Yeah, because I think it's really important to mention this idea that it doesn't always equal a device. I remember I had a student who was in a car accident and had a tracheotomy. And I went to visit him, and the people were acting like, well, we don't really know what he wants to say. And I was like, um, well, he's still got cognitive function. And Krista was like, give him a whiteboard and a marker. And sure enough, he started, you know, telling us everything that he wanted to say. And it wasn't like he needed any really special intervention. He just needed, right. you know, to be able to write. But now, you know, obviously, that's a whiteboard isn't the solution for everybody, but also sometimes a device isn't. And there have been some low-tech developments. Yeah, um, PEX is something that's really well known in, in the uh, world of autism, picture exchange communication system. Um, and it's the idea of using usually a, a binder or a board of symbols and um, creating a sentence and putting them on a strip and then taking that sentence strip to your communication partner. Um, and I think you know, it's, a, it's a wonderful system and it certainly is um, appropriate for certain individuals. Um, however, I've seen some people sort of get stuck like that they have to do PECs. And that's a lot of work to search for your symbol and, and peel it off and and put it on a sentence strip and then peel that off and take it to somebody. And, um, and if they need that, if they need that connection with, with their communication that partner. social part of handing it to if the person. That, you know, and that's something that they're working on. And, um, and physically getting all those symbols is something that isn't too taxing on them. But let's, you know, if we have a student who maybe eye contact isn't a problem and making the connection with their partner isn't a problem, but the physical act of, of doing all those steps, they just give up before they even start, well, that's probably not the right solution for them. But you don't want to get stuck like, well, they have to use PECs, or that's what we do with these, with you know, a child with autism, we have to start with PECs. Well, if they can point to the symbol, you know, that could give them a lot faster response right. and maybe that more immediate gratification, and then they're going to be more successful. But if they're kind of stuck in the whole, um, you know, pulling it off and all this Velcro, <laughs> then, you know, and, and let's say their their vocabulary gets so big, are they going to pull their binder with them in a wagon, you know, <laughs> behind them? Um, now, Bondi and Frost, the <laughs> inventors of PECs, are the, they might disagree with what I'm saying, I'm sure, but um, that's just something that I think you have to think in a practical way as well and look at the student that you're working with. And you so. mentioned, like, how sometimes it could maybe even be too taxing for them to, you know, to do all of that work. Let's talk about folks that, you know, maybe don't have the skills for keyboarding. Sure. Well, and I was going to mention that um, there is a wonderful um, book and called Every Move um, Counts, and, and now it's called Every Move Counts, Clicks, and Chats. And um, Corsten, Foss, and Barry have put together uh, something for um, maybe children who seem very severe and you're in sort of an interest inventory to see um, do they turn their head to look at something or um, do smells or lights you know get their attention I mean what are their reactions you're looking very closely at um, at what they how they respond to any sort of stimuli and that is meaningful you know um, you know crying is communication mm -hmm. um, not that we want them to cry of course <laughs> but um, but just looking at um, anything that they might do that you can then systematically shape into a communicative response. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that is a wonderful resource. And I've used it even with children who, who would be considered severe, as well as um, I recently did it with a child who has autism, just because you get stuck in the same thing. Well, he likes these gummies and he likes this toy. Well, let's see what else he likes. You know, if we're kind of um, in this, you know, in kind of, stagnating in our in our therapy well, let's see and he did he responded to some tastes and some smells and things that she hadn't really considered before so it it could be used um, in a lot of different ways but I think um, that if you see some people when they see a child who's just who's just laying and, and um, they can't move their 
arms or their legs and they can't eat and all these different things that they just think, well, what, what do they really do? Well, <laughs> they can do something. <laughs> right. Uh, and this so. kind of goes with your idea of, uh, you know, when we think about folks, they, they may be nonverbal, they may have limited verbal abilities, they may, you know, be classified as, you know, in the severe category, but you always presume competence. Right. So, um, and that's the safest assumption is to presume competence, to go in and thinking that they can't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think that they can't or you think that they can, well, you're right. Right. <laughs> so, um, so you have to presume competence and just have high expectations because when you lower your expectations, then I mean, it's just not fair. It's not fair to anyone. Um, and so I was also going to say that with AAC, um, it's all different diagnoses. You know, it's autism, it's cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, um, severe apraxia of speech, um, all different um, degenerative diseases, and, and of all abilities. I have, I have kids who are of average intelligence, you know, who use AAC, as well as students who, you know, have some cognitive impairment. So um, it, there's, um, there's no prerequisites. Right. So AAC isn't just for the folks that you're feeling like, wow, you know, this kid is really bright. You should get them AAC. This is for kids that have cognitive impairments as well. Oh, definitely. Okay. And, um, and when I was thinking of some ideas for our talk today, um, I thought, you know, some kids, they really make my job easy. You know, they take right to, to AAC. They, they navigate their devices. They are eager to communicate. Um, and that's great. But the responsibility to find a way for all kids to communicate, and, and adults as well, lies with the team. It lies with, you know, the, adult, the adults, the, the families, the teachers, the SLPs, um, OTs, PTs, you know, music therapy, whoever's involved with them, um, the responsibility lies with us. I mean, yes, the child is part of that team as well, um, but it's just so often that I, I hear, well, they don't want to use it. Well, they're five. <laughs> you know, they might not want to brush their teeth. Are you making it motivating? Are you making it worth their while? Turn and look at yourself. And, and don't put the blame on the child as, for, as to why it's not working. There's something that you can do, you know, to, I mean, I have, I have danced silly. I have, <laughs> you know, I have brought all kinds of toys. I have run around a room. I've done all different things. Polish nails. I um, remember it had one guy that liked you to polish nails. Sure, we've, we've done that. Um, you know, I bring in, you know, videos, baby pictures, you know, whatever they like, <laughs> you know, the, the cardinals, whatever it is, we can, you know, we can find a way, and it's up to us to do that. Excellent. Well, now that we've talked a little bit about who are good candidates for AAC, which is pretty broad, <laughs> yes. and the timeline, we're going to move into narrowing into children with autism now. And we're going to talk a little bit about how AAC benefits um, children who have autism. My PowerPoint, there we go. Um, so what do you see being the benefits of using AAC for children with an autism diagnosis? Well, if, if that child is having difficulty with communication and they have, um, we're noticing that, you know, their language development is um, delayed and that is, you know, usually it's pretty common with autism, um, we want to try some different all-com techniques. And I think, you know, a great benefit is that children with autism frequently are visual learners. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, vision, you know, AAC provides a visual, um, you know, a visual for language. It's a visual representation of language. And that really can be the key that unlocks a lot for kids with autism. Okay. Um, it helps them to be included in, you know, in a special ed classroom or in a regular ed classroom. You know, how are they going to participate if they, if they don't have a way to express what they know and, and um, you know, and answer questions that the teacher may be asking. And I'm sorry that my, most of my experiences are obviously in a school setting, so right. I, I'm, you know, of course speaking to uh, a classroom and mm -hmm. um, that type of environment. Um, also with literacy, I, you know, giving um, the representation, representation of the letters, to hear the words, to hear the sounds, to see them spell. I mean, most device, if you're talking about a high-tech device, you know, it, it's going to have a keyboard, um, although low-tech devices, I mean, you have uh, alphabet you know, boards and pages. It just, again, it's the visual um, to bridge the gap um, for literacy or for social communication. Um, obviously, having, you know, being independent in your communication, you're, you're more independent, but that's um, something as well. 
Okay. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times when we talk about children with autism, they uh, like structure, they like schedules. Um, does AAC kind of provide that for them? Yes, because it's going to be the same. There's a predictability. Um, you know, here's my device or here's my, my board and those symbols are going to, to be there and tomorrow they'll be there and the next day they'll be there. And um, I'm a big proponent of something called a language acquisition through motor planning. Um, which has been very uh, successful with students with autism. And it's the idea of, of keeping things in the same place and uh, there's a motor plan for where those are. Just like we all have motor plans when we type or when we you know, go into our house and we flip the light switch or, or when we drive our car. You know, we mm -hmm. don't think too much about where the, you know, the turn signal is or, mm -hmm. or um, our cruise control. Um, so we all have motor plans and you can make a motor plan for language as well. And we have motor plans when we're speaking, where our tongue is moving. Those are, mm -hmm. those are all motor plans. Um, and so if you have a device where things stay consistent, they can have a motor plan um, for language as well on an AAC device or board. Um, so, and uh, another great thing about that is if they have a way to communicate and let um, individuals know what they want or what they're unhappy about, we might see a decrease in negative behaviors instead mm -hmm. of acting out and you know, throwing themselves on the floor or um, uh, running from the room, they may be able to communicate better as to what's bothering them. You right. know, it's, it's before too, they hit a critical mass. Right. Um, so you know, it's too loud in here. I, I just want a cheese cracker. Uh, you know, whatever <laughs> it might be. Uh, if we can help them to communicate that and then decrease that negative behavior, and of course that's you know, great for families right. and you know at school. Okay. Very good. So now that we've talked a little bit about how it specifically benefits children with autism, this, this idea of the, the visual learning and being able to be included, um, let's talk a little bit about how you choose the best device for a child with autism. Definitely. Um, I have done many, many, many evaluations. I've been with BASC for about seven years, seven and a half years, and I've done quite a few evaluations. and. That is, in my opinion, the way that we, we choose the best device um, for a child is, is by doing you know, a full evaluation, getting everyone involved. Um, we're going to look, feature matching is, is the, kind of the key phrase here mm -hmm. when it comes to AAC. We look at, we look at our child um, and what skill set they have and we look at the device and see how that can meet their needs. We're going to match the child to the device. And, um, you know, if a child can access it with their hand, if they can access it with a switch, um, uh, through eye gaze, through um, a head tracker, which is like a dot on the forehead, mm -hmm. um, we, we need a device that can, can do that for them. Um, I look at, do they respond well to that motor plan? Mm -hmm. um, do they understand, um, and again, there are no prerequisites, so I don't mean they have to be able to categorize or they have right. to have any of these, but you look. Um, some children respond better to um, a, a setup that's categorized or a setup that's color coded or a setup that um, is a, what we call a visual scene where mm -hmm. it's actually a picture of, of, the, of you know, the classroom or the lunchroom or the park versus things being in, in different categories. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to look at access and the language system that, that's used. Uh, there's myriad other things that you know, when you go through a feature matching. I do trials because, okay, let's trial them on this device and see how they do in their classroom and mm -hmm. at home and, and, um, and just in a regular setting, regular day, how do they do? Um, and sometimes, you know, we realize then this isn't quite right, let's try something else. Um, so there is a, there's no concrete, you know, formula, sometimes it's trial and error. Um, but I think something that's also really important is is consulting with the whole team, mm -hmm. you know, talking to the family and talking to, um, and I'm not saying this always happens, but right. ideally you want to involve everyone, the teacher, um, and I feel fortunate compared to going to a hospital mm -hmm. and, um, and being evaluated in sort of this isolated setting, I'm fortunate enough that I can come back if they're having a bad day. Mm -hmm. um, I can talk to their teacher, I talk to their SLP, I can talk to their family, um, the aide that works with them. So I feel very fortunate that I have all of those people to consult with when we're trying to make this decision. Um, I also ask the child, you know, mm -hmm. if we have a couple devices out, which one do you like? You yeah. know? Um, and 
not that they always get the final choice. A lot of times they like the one that I like too. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is, and I make sure I put that in the report that, right. um, that they, they pointed at this device as, as their favorite. Um, but I've had some children who are very upset when I have to take the device away at the end of a evaluation. You know, mm. they want to, they're hugging that. They want to take that wow. with them. Um, and sometimes I just have to leave it because I can't do that. <laughs> I can't take away their words. Um, but I do try to get them, you know, their own device that they can have. Um, all the time because they can be personalized to mm -hmm. their desires too I remember you said you had one child who wanted the voice to be British yeah sometimes <laughs> they want a British voice we, I try to let them be involved in you know choosing their voice um, I have one student who loves NASCAR and so he has to have um, even I'm even though I'm all about core language and high frequency words NASCAR is his core it's his high frequency <laughs> he needs to talk about those drivers and um, and the race tracks, you know, that he that he uh, goes to sometimes, and also likes to watch on TV. So yeah, you definitely it's personalized. They have personal information in there, um, as well as you know just uh, high frequency words and, and things like that. But yeah, they they do have um, play an active role. And I tried to get my um, my students uh, frequently involved in what they want in their device. What picture mm -hmm. do you want to represent that? And um, I know I'm going to talk about this student later, but he came into therapy with the DVD cover of Hotel Transylvania, mm. and he was into that, and he needed vampire and werewolf mm. and um, mummy, you know, and, you know, I kind of threw out the lesson plan, and I thought, we're going to talk about this, because that's what he wants to talk about. He wanted some more vocabulary, you know, in his device. We asked him questions about the movie, um, but that kind of isn't really necessarily, again, how to choose the best device, but I... Well, but it's nothing, it's, it's definitely not one size fits all. No. That you can, you know, personalize it to what the, what the child wants, their favorite movies, their interests, whether it's NASCAR, if they want a British voice because they just think that sounds cool, right. um, all of those types of things. And it can grow with them as well. You know, if the, the device that they got when they were eight is not going to be the same as the device you know, that they're using when they're approaching high school. Well, actually. Well, the items that might be in it. But. Well, that's, that's something we also have to consider because usually insurance and Medicaid only buy a device every five years. Ah, okay. So you need to choose something that can grow with them. Right. Now, yeah, the vocabulary may, um, may change, but you need to have the ability to change that vocabulary exactly. or um, increase uh, the number of symbols per page and those types of things. So you have to think for the future because I have, I have three-year-olds using the same device that a 33-year-old would right. use. Um, so you want to choose one that is able to be adapted, yes. right, because they're not going to need the same pictures when they're eight that they do when they're 15, necessarily. Well, some of them. Well, it, and that <laughs> can get into a whole, you know, can get into the real nitty-gritty of, um, you know, the, the core words and, and uh, let's say you have 84 pictures on a page and you still may have those same 84 pictures right. um, when, you know, when you're in early childhood and when you're in high school. But it's just how you use them, you know. Are you just yeah. saying more, and then, you know, um, I would like to talk more about what uh, we talked about yesterday, you know. Right. Or, you know <laughs> okay. how you're using, you know, just like how, you know, if you think about how you're, ch you know, how you're a typically uh, developing child has the first words, and then, you know, right. Their the complexity increases, increases as they get mm -hmm. older, um, as far as what they do with those words. Right. So, so when you choose a device, you want to make sure that it's one that grow with you. Mm -hmm. Right. There's definitely not just a one size fits all. Correct. Kind of thing. Yes. Okay, very good. All right. Well, now that you've, let's say you've chosen the device, how do you uh, include families and teachers in how to use the device? Um, well, we have um, what I call regional consultant workshops from some of the bigger companies. They have um, consultants in your region that will come and uh, free of charge, you know, do workshops like Frankie Roman Company, you know, our consultant comes in and, and does workshops. Dynavox is another one, Satillo, those are three uh, big companies and they come and, and provide workshops free of charge, um, you know, locally so that we can get people, you know, um, you know, families that are new to this to come to that as well as a refresher for other people. Mm -hmm. And um, also the teachers and SLPs, it's great if you can get several members of the team at a training. Um, there's lots of web-based learning. Uh, you can go online to the to your whatever company made your child's device and and learn things there. You know, mm -hmm. implementation toolkit or a, a learning lab or a webinar. Um, they have 
that was online, you know, too. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, um, and some of them have CEUs, too, for those <laughs> who are interested in that. Um, I do a lot of trainings. Um, not every school district has their own specialist, per se, um, but the SLP may be that point person and may provide that one-on-one um, uh, -on -one training. But I'll go out and, and train um, a group of people or do a one-on-one -on -one training um, with a family just recently met with uh, a mother who, you know, just got the device for their, mm -hmm. their child and you know, just wanted some of the basics because I find that, um, you know, you, don't, you can't overwhelm <laughs> right uh, in the beginning. So, you know, just giving those, those few basics to get them started and really be encouraging. Um, so those are some of the ways that um, we include them, both families and, and teachers. So it's not like when you go to Best Buy and you buy a computer and they really help you choose your computer and then you go home and you're on your own. Mm -hmm. In this instance, you know, you help them choose the best device and then there's, there's multiple resources for support as yes. they are implementing that. Right. And that's another thing. If we talk about the iPad, you're not really going to get that kind of support with your, with your iPad um, or your app necessarily. I mean, I would certainly support and, and give trainings and, and help people. But as far as like having a consultant or um, having all those, you know, um, resources, sometimes those aren't available. Um, but all right well now we're going to talk a little bit about how even when you've done all of this great stuff uh, people aren't buying in um, like you mentioned how you hate to take a device away from a kid that's hugging it you know mm -hmm. take away their words mm -hmm. um, so, you know it seems like wow if you if you found out that the kid could communicate using this why wouldn't you you know have it strapped to you know their their chair or their back all the time but yet there are some people that are very hesitant to adopt AAC why, why are some of the you know what, what keeps people from embracing AAC and this is a, a daily struggle for me um, for sure I mean I can talk about all these things sort of in this ideal world how it, it all plays out but um, uh, the truth of the matter is that there are uh, I run into these barriers all the time um, and from, you know, families, but also from teachers and even SLPs, um, it, you know, it's I'm being honest <laughs> that there, you know, there is a lot of uh, negative attitude towards um, the system. So, you know, they don't want to adopt it or buy into it because there's just already this preconceived notion of um, that it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, they might be intimidated by the system. Um, some people just, you know, maybe they're just not into technology and they feel very um, intimidated by, you know, the look of it or how to program it. Um, they don't see how it's just like doing, it's just like teaching, you know, any other student or like doing language therapy with any other student. They just feel very much like it's a, it's a roadblock to that. Um, the families, a lot of times, I feel like they have the, the social stigma. Um, that's one of their barriers in that they, they just don't want their child to look different or the child doesn't want to look different. Um, they don't want to have that out in, in public. They just feel like it draws attention um, to them and to their family and they really see that as a negative. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if, if someone hasn't had a lot of training, you know, then they, they have trouble, um, you know, using the device, which makes sense, but, you know, that's something we can remedy mm -hmm. um, pretty easily. Uh, something I see a lot, especially with um, parents, is that they have this long history of anticipating their child's wants and needs. Mm -hmm. And so they are just so used to getting him his drink and his food and his favorite DVD and, um, you know, anything that he wants and they've, um, that they don't see the need for the communication. You know, they don't see why he would need to request those things or or um, or comment about it because they're just so used to the system that they have you know and if you can think if you're if you're a mother you know we think about how we um, anticipate the needs of our child and and at each stage of their development you know we kind of go with them on mm -hmm. that but if they've sort of stopped in this one stage uh, you know it can seem like it's really tough to get over to the next one and mm -hmm. if they're kind of stuck in this anticipation um, then and it's hard for them to see the, the point of the device. Um, but I always think there's so much that's happening, you know, when right. you're away from your child at school that they could tell you about. Right. Um, uh, and I, I think they just, they just forget about that. Or I'm, I, I, you know, I don't want to put words in their mouth. I'm not sure exactly why, but I just, 
I feel like you know they maybe they're not realizing how much more that the child could could tell them. Do you think some of them are also afraid of the cost of the device? Yeah, um, I mean, my goal, and I, I have a really good track record, is that the cost of the family is minimal, that we get it covered by insurance or Medicaid or um, the schools. Uh, we have a loan, we have a lending library, um, also charities like the Variety Club in St. Louis, um, the Elks, they all can help uh, to fund the device, but I think parents um, yeah, they're concerned about that. Uh, they could, they're get concerned about breaking it. Right. They don't want to take it with them because they're afraid that it will break. Um, now, a lot of the devices come with a one or two year warranty for mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, but yeah, they get very concerned about that. Um, so that's another issue. Um, some people are just resistant to change. You know, mm -hmm. they're used to, you know, doing therapy the way they've always done it for the last so many years. Then they, they just want to keep doing it that way. Right. Um, and also just this belief in um, different AAC myths. And one that I, that just last week I was talking to a teacher, and a, a wonderful teacher, very well-meaning, um, but I said, well, you know, this student, she, you know, and she, she may still be talking, and, and she said, I really thought if we got her a device that meant she wasn't going to ever talk. And I said, oh, my goodness, no, never. <laughs> right. You know, no, this could be a springboard for her to, you know, to verbal communication, for oral, you know, speech. Um, but just that idea that if we get a child's advice that they'll stop talking mm. or that they won't talk or they'll become lazy, oh, that one really gets me. It's hard to maintain <laughs> my composure when, when some of these uh, myths come to the, the forefront that, um, yeah, they think that, I mean, that's, the, I think, the main one, that they will stop talking or that they'll never talk. And that's why a lot of people wait and make it a last resort. And when, you know, all else has failed and, you know, the situation is so in such disrepair and, you know, kind of a shambles. Oh, well, let's bring in the AAC person. <laughs> you know, and that it right. can be hard. Um, so I think those are, are some of the main uh, barriers, barriers to um, buy-in and, and adoption um, of, of AAC. And I think that's really important. I mean, just as a parent who I did baby signs with my kids, you know, because I knew that they could sign before they could talk. And some people would tell me, well, they're never going to talk if when they do this, you get them more. And guess what? All three, all three, all three of my kids <laughs> yeah. speak. There's, there's you know? no research to support that <laughs> any form of AZ would, would delay, uh, you know, or um, yeah. prevent um, oral, oral speech. But if anything, um, it would encourage it. Correct. Yes. Um, sometimes it can take the pressure off. It provides a model. Um, it's it, there's really just so many um, great things about it. Uh, the other thing I've seen a lot is, um, and I I have been surprised that some some families they really do just these small little gestures or things that no one else would understand. Mm -hmm. um, they understand what their child means by those things, mm -hmm. and that's wonderful. The only thing is that your child isn't always going to be with you, you know, right. and we want them to be able to communicate with more people. And that's, you know, and that's why it's important because it's great that that works at home mm -hmm. um, and, and they really can convey all these different stories. It's like, wow, I, I wouldn't have gotten that from, you know, those several motions that he, he did. Um, and those are valid, but it's just that that limits his world so much and limits his communica communication partners so much that we really we want to have another way you know, another mode. In addition, you know, it's a multimodal. Right. So, um, which is another leads, way to encourage. Right, which leads right into encouraging uh, adoption and buy-in. Um, and as you said, this is something that you encounter all the time. Um, you can really help me out, advance my slide. I'm in a little trouble. There we go. I got it. All right, so ways to encourage adoption and buy-in. So, and as Krista and I developed this presentation, she said, no, I have to be honest with them. This, these don't always work. <laughs> but, <laughs> sometimes, but sometimes they do. So tell us about some of the ways that you can encourage that. Um, yeah, like I, I was going to say, I'm always looking for that workshop or that webinar or that you know, training that's going to tell me how to get everybody to buy into this. But um, I just haven't found that, um, that workshop yet. <laughs> um, but these are some things that um, I do try and that have been successful, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. Basis, and um, one of those is, is modeling. Um, so modeling what what you want um, the SLP the, to do, or the teacher to do, or the parent to do. Um, 
and showing them, you know, how it works and getting them more, you know, familiar with the device so it's not something to be afraid of. Um, and then providing all that training, you know, going to trainings and having, you know, one-on-one -on -one trainings or small group trainings. Just, again, to, um, you're not going to break it, you're not going to, you know, <laughs> things can be undone. You know, they're like, I'm going to ruin everything. It's like, well, we have ways to get it back to the way it used to be, you know, right. and it's hard. Um, I mean, I'm not saying things haven't been <laughs> messed up before, <laughs> but, um, but there are usually ways to, to get it back, you know, the way it was. Um, providing homework. So um, a couple of my uh, teachers in SLPs, they, let's say we're working on these certain words, and they'll, they'll send a homework page home, you know, practice these at home, mm -hmm. so that it's something that they can see. You know, maybe it has the actual symbol sequence that the child would need to follow. Um, and they can just sort of, you know, just sort of like you'd send home an articulation, you know, worksheet to practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you can send this home to practice. Um, a lot of times the, the kiddos, you know, they're comfortable with it. Um, they can kind of take that, uh, the leadership role and show yeah. their parent how to do it. Um, dispelling the myths. So that's something that I, I have to do. And, you know, even after seven years, you know, meeting that teacher just, you know, last week and having to dispel that myth. And, you know, she... She was just like, oh, I'm just so glad to hear that. <laughs> well, no problem. You know, I'm <laughs> glad to tell you that that is, that is a myth. Um, I also do uh, lectures at some of the local universities and, and things like that to hopefully get um, the, the next generation of SLPs and teachers to be more aware of all these things so that they, um, they won't see it as a barrier. Um, setting small targets, so starting small, and that's like when I do those one-on-one -on -one trainings, you know, I'm just, I give them some basics and just some things that they can start, um, just start this, if you always read a book, maybe you could during, do it, you know, during your, your nightly, um, you know, reading or, you know, in the morning for breakfast and just, you know, set those small targets and then build on them. We don't want to just limit that we only use the device at, at snack time or we only use the device when we're reading, but just to get them started, you know, mm -hmm. and then see how it works, and then they can move forward. Um, getting everybody involved in the evaluation process, then they, they're a stakeholder, mm -hmm. you know, and then they feel like they have, um, uh, they've been involved, they have, they have input, and then they want to see it be successful. So the more right. people you get involved and who feel like they're a part of it, um, you know, if, if the parent is aware of, you know, this decision-making process, um, then then they're more likely to follow through. So that's great. Um, and then viewing successful AAC users. So, you know, even if just finding a video on YouTube and, and showing, um, look at this person, you know, they have a job, they're giving lectures, they're doing, you know, um, or just here they are being successful in their classroom so that they can see, you know, maybe the light at the end of the tunnel or um, that it's not such a, a bad thing or a negative thing or, you know, um, and, and then for the child themselves to see, you know, other users because, you know, as if you're typically developing, you have, you know, typical oral speech, right. you're, you, how many models do you have? Everyone is a model of, of, of that oral speech, but how many models do you see um, that are using AAC? And so that's why, you know, modeling is such a good idea for, you know, the therapist, but also to watch uh, models, you know, there's plenty of YouTube clips of Right, and I think that would be good because we've talked about how typically when Krista says, you know, that she works in AAC, people go, oh, like Stephen Hawking? Oh, like Roger Ebert? You know, the late Roger Ebert? Um, and so, yeah, th those are examples, but that's not going to mean a whole lot to a five-year-old, you know, mm -hmm. to, to see it. Yeah, or, or their parents, you know. Right, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's certainly something, but it's, right. you know, there's a lot more examples and just available. go to YouTube. You, yep. can, you don't have to necessarily know somebody in the neighborhood. No, no. YouTube has, has plenty of, of great clips. And there's some resources at the end of the presentation today that um, you could, uh, links to, you know, mm -hmm. certain people have great links to resources like that. So. Well, now let's talk about some of the success stories that, that you've experienced. We're going to talk about two of your kiddos that you've worked with right. that have had um, success. Well, and I, I used two um, who are on the autism spectrum, since that was sort of our focus for today, although I have lots of success stories with kids of all different um, diagnoses, per se. But first I'll talk about my friend Zach. Um, he's had his device for several years, and when we started, you know, he was, um, he was really, he's a good user, but he, you know, it was just, we were beginning, and it was just mostly one and two words. Um, and then, unfortunately, he had a situation where they really, 
the teacher really wasn't using it and, the fan, and his mom really wasn't using it and sometimes the SLP wasn't using it either. Um, and I remember at his meeting um, being so discouraged because um, I had to leave and go to another meeting and someone told me that after I left, all, that it was just very negative about the communication mm -hmm. device and um, everyone was just speaking very negatively about it. But he went to another school, which is, um, he went to our our school, our special school for children with autism, and now his device is more integrated into his classroom, and um, he's always, you know, he's always been able to use it, right. and that's that's the great thing. Um, but now, uh, you know, if he wants something like the iPad, you know, I get, I want the black iPad. <laughs> you okay, know, uh, we're getting pretty specific. Here. Yeah, <laughs> because um, I have a black iPad, and his SLP has a gray case on her iPad, and so we make him be specific on which iPad are you wanting, because they have different apps on them. <laughs> right. Um, but he's the one who brought in his Hotel Transylvania DVD, and he, you know, he wants um, different vocabulary programmed in there. You know, and he loves dinosaurs and he loves cowboys, and you know, so those words uh, are on his device. Although we want him to use, you know. Verbs and other, you know, not just nouns, but um, other words as well. But he comments, you know, and he um, and his navigation is just is so fast, you know, as far as getting to different things. You know, I was doing some categories, you know, and name something that's cold, boop, 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 you know, snow. I mean, he was just so quick to get. He's got to go through several pages, and he is just so fast. He knows where where his vocabulary is, um, and he's really. Uh, He's really a pleasure, you know, to work with. He's one of those that makes my job pretty easy yeah. uh, with him. But I, I can really see progress, and I get excited when I know I can't wait to go to their IEP because I have such great <laughs> news to report, right. you know. Um, so he, he's definitely a success story, and, and I hope continues to be a success story. And, and he has more words also, right. more oral speech. Has, oh, okay, um, oral speech as well. Yes, yeah. so he... Um, he has uh, yeah, more attempts and, and more approximations, so we definitely see that too. Great. Yes. Um, now this next gal I thought was particularly interesting because mm -hmm. um, you said Hannah was echolalic. Yes, Hannah um, is echolalic. Uh, or, well, I mean, I guess she she still sort of is, but I mean that was the main thing, and and so a lot of people. And again, it was a pretty negative situation. I can't really say that there was a whole lot of buy-in from her team per se. But she, um, she was echolalic, but when it came to using a device, um, and of course everyone said, well, she can talk, so she doesn't need this. But the thing was, she was just repeating everything, and there was nothing novel or spontaneous. Um, but with her device, she could be. She could answer a question instead of just saying the question over again. You know, if you said, what is this? She'd say, what is this? But with her device, she could say, it is an apple. Or, you know, she could tell you what it was. Um, and I found that to be important. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she could, uh, I mean, she could formulate, if you showed her one time, I mean, she had very long sentences. I mean, she just didn't have any problem navigating or, or you know, putting words together on So there. she could say all, all of this with her device, but orally she was only repeating what yes. other people said. Yes. Um, well, she was, but now. But now? Since her device, <laughs> she, uh, she doesn't need it anymore. Um, she did begin to answer things. Um, uh, you know, make novel utterances that answer things more spontaneous, it, it, spontaneously instead of just repeating. Um, and I, of course, think it's because of the device. I think it was a visual representation of the language. It provided a model. Um, but I, like I said, I never really got a lot of buy-in with anybody else, but I see it as a success story because she doesn't <laughs> need her device anymore. And I think her, um, her, her oral speech uh, has improved a lot. And she, you know, she's functioning better in her classroom and her, all of her environments. So. All right. Well, for our, our last success story, I'm going to show a picture that you put on your Facebook page um, shortly after the State of the Union address where President Obama talked about wanting to better fund early childhood education programs. He visited a preschool, and this picture was in the media. And a lot of people commented on the magnifying glasses, but what did you comment well, on? Well, you know, I, I did a double take. I'm like, there's a Dynavox in that picture, and it's on the Gateway 40 page. I mean, I knew, and you know, I sent it to my, my Dynavox okay. consultant. I said, you know, um, check out this picture. Look, you know, there's a student using a communication device um, with the president. And I thought to myself, you know, how wonderful it was that, you know, our president could see a communication device in action, and um, and we we. Brooke and I spoke about the fact that how much would that student have been able to participate or interact with the President of the United States if he didn't have his device there. 
and would he be able to tell anybody what happened at school if he, if he didn't have the device? Right. Does he have any motion that he makes to his mom and dad that would say, the president came to my school today? You know, and maybe his, his parents may have been aware, but, you right. know, maybe some, someone else, you know, even, uh, I mean, we know how our kids talk to everybody, the, the, you know, the cashier at the grocery store might, right. <laughs> might be interested to learn that the president was at the school. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, you know, and so we've got a kid here who otherwise might not have been able to tell the president anything, um, tell anybody that he met the president, and, and now we're, you know, he had that ability because of that device. And we don't know if this particular child has autism or, no. you know, some other uh, issue that's, um, if, if they're nonverbal. But it was just kind of neat to see that in the yeah. media. And just that I could, you know, you can tell that they can participate in whatever the activity was that day. That's great. So. All right. Well, now we'd like to open it up um, if our audience has any questions. And um, if you do, we've got a microphone for you. And please say your, your, your name and your area. And, uh, and uh, we'll try to answer those for you as best we can. Hi, Chris. And I'm Joyce Renaud. And I'm actually a clinical supervisor. But I also do first steps. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were talking earlier about having the parents be successful users of AC. Mm -hmm. Do you currently have any parents that, that you're able to have other parents network with? Oh. And, you know, maybe from a parent-to-parent -parent perspective? That's a great question. Um, you know, in the past I had done several, um, like, get-togethers, you know, on the weekends, like meet at, meet at the mall or meet at Barnes & Noble for um, users of AAC and their families. So. Um, and another colleague of I, and, I, and I tried to do like a luncheon, like a brown bag lunch for families. Unfortunately, the attendance wasn't always, you know, the best, and um, so those have kind of fallen out. But there are times where um, I'll ask a, a mom if I can connect, you know, this other mom, you know, with them. Um, maybe, you know, their children have um, the same diagnosis, or um, I think that they would be a good resource. So I do try to make those connections between um, families and you know we have tried to do some of those uh, family networking things but unfortunately they haven't always you know they haven't always worked out but um, it is something to keep at you know and it's a good reminder to me that we should you know continue to try to do that because they do make good resources for each other. I actually have another question. Sure. Um, you talked about that the AAC devices are often a springboard to oral communication mm -hmm. and I think sometimes I what we encounter with parents and with society, with teachers, with everyone, is that when they think about communication, they think so much within that realm of just speaking. Mm -hmm. So, do you, you know, do do you go into that with your parents that being able to communicate is more than just being able to verbalize or speak? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, I try to try to emphasize the the multiple modalities so that. Um, because a lot of families are, are I've found, have, are more comfortable with um, their child using the manual signs. Um, and I'm like, that, that's certainly part of it. And at least, you know, that'll never break. <laughs> you know, hopefully it won't break. You know, you always have no that battery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's no batteries, no uh, technical difficulties there. Unless, of course, you break a finger, I guess. But um, although some kids don't have, you know, the, the tone or the fine motor ability. But um, I can sidetrack there. Um, but yeah, the, the idea that there's multiple modalities and that, you know, your child, they may have some, you know, verbal approximations or some true words that they have and that's going to be part of it and the device is going to be part of it and that, yeah, it's this total communication approach versus, you know, one or the other, you know, um, kind of a black and white situation. Um, and that the idea also that, um, that their speech may come, but let's not let's not forget about the now and the present of, you know, um, I, I have so many kids, well, they, they're saying these several words and that's great, but it's like, think about what a typical five-year-old could say. Um, and we want them to be able to convey, you know, so much more than just those few, you know, five words that they have. And we're going to continue. I was just in an IEP where I had to say, I want them to talk. I want them to talk, you know, because they think I'm just the device lady. <laughs> and it's like, no, I, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, we're sorry, but we're having your user voice. I'm like, I want you to do that. It's just that, you know, this is something in addition so that they can participate more. I, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And I actually have one last <laughs> question. 
When you talk about the, the benefits of using AAC with children with autism, can you explain a little bit more um, what you're talking about when you're talking about the predictability? Um, well, you know, the idea that um, children with autism frequently like, you know, a routine. Um, sometimes we use, you know, a visual schedule that, you know, they want things to kind of stay the same. Well, when you use, you know, when they have their communication device, um, they can become comfortable with the way it's set up. Um, on certain devices, you know, the symbols are always going to be in the same place. So there's, there's that predictability there. Um, you know, people in general are just unpredictable. But at least, you know, the system, sometimes they respond better to, to technology because it's the same, you know, and they can kind of, they kind of know what's going to happen with it versus, you know, a person. It's like, well, I'm not sure how they're going to talk today or if they might start singing or if they're going to, you know, and it's like, at least I know this is going to be the same. You know, and, and maybe if it is, um, like certain devices have that motor plan, it's like, okay, well, I've got this down, you know, and it's not going to change. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I am Jayanti Ray, and I teach undergraduate and graduate courses at the Department of Communication Disorders. First of all, I would like to thank you for this excellent talk on AAC and how that applies to autism. Mm -hmm. My little question is about the abandonment issues. Ah, yes. So I do know from time to time we all tend to like certain devices and at certain times we feel like the device is no longer going to be in use. Mm -hmm. So in your practice, uh, what types of abandonment uh, concerns you have actually experienced and what strategies you use to address those concerns? Ooh, another good question. Um, I certainly um, have had devices that have been abandoned, you know, it's just, it's, um, it's, sometimes it's just, you know, kind of impossible to, to avoid it. Um, there have been cases where the family has donated the device, which I always think, well, at least maybe I can use it with someone, someone else. Um, there have been, you know, with the iPad, um, some families have decided to abandon their, you know, dedicated device in, in favor of an iPad. and. What I've tried to do is just embrace it um, because, you know, at first I want to resist and be like, well, no, this is the right device for them. But um, I've tried to open my mind and, and to embrace, you know, what they've brought me and make the best of it. So, okay, they've abandoned their Dynamox and now they're using this iPad. Well, I'm going to make the best of it. Um, and, and then, you know, I think then, you, you know, you get that more, the buy-in from the family too because it's sort of, you know, maybe this was more their idea and um, so, that's one way to address it is just sort of to try to find what what do they you know what do they want or what's going to keep them involved in in the process and in in the use of something to you know to supplement their communication um, so that's that's one thing I've I've had to um, adjust for um, as far as what else to do when the device come I mean I guess then you know you step in and you try to do um, to try to find out why, you know, what's the reason, and, and, and is there anybody that I can find who can work with me, you know, to, to pull them back into the, the system, and, um, you know, I, so many compromises get made, like, okay, well, they'll just use it at school then, or okay, well, they'll just, you know, and, and it's, it's funny, because when you start out, you know, you're just an idealist, and you just want everything to be perfect, but, you know, you realize you just have to, you know, sometimes you just have to compromise, or else you're not going to, you know, make any headway at all, I guess. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Oh, well, definitely, that was a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> that, it's a lot to take care of. I yes, didn't understand yeah. that. So all, all of us need to see success, you know, taking place in all of our clients, and those are real challenges in the field. Mm -hmm. And I get that all the time. You know, somebody would tell me, oh, this device I got from Dynavox, I can't use it anymore. Probably I don't want to use it. I don't want to know more about it. And then you have to call upon the team members to kind of start from the scratch and Exactly. Build up everything, all that faith on the device. Yes, the device can be used, you know, in some yeah, very uh, functional ways and help with communication modes. Yeah, and try to so bring it back. And, and that's the thing, sometimes if you get the, the wrong device or um, if they didn't have a, the right evaluation, you know, those negative attitudes can really build up and it, it's sort of hard to, um, to come back in and, and try to make it, you know, seem, um, you know, enticing and, and fun and worthwhile, you know, but, um, you know, that's part of our job is to, to just keep at it and, and uh, that's what I certainly try to do. Thank you so much. I have one more question. Sure. It's uh, not related to this. It's about LAMP. 
Oh, language yeah. acquisition via motor patterns. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of kids with autism using that and getting devices that can you know, yes. keep them just well content for at least five to ten years? Um, <laughs> I'm I, just saying it's just a Dynavox device or any printer on the device you have and you could use that over and over, learning new vocabulary, changing the overlay. So does that work really well? I am. Um, it was, you know, I, I, you go to so many workshops and sometimes it's sort of a review of, you know, or, you know, just the same thing, different day. But when I went to my, a LAMP workshop, I thought, now this is really, you know, different and interesting and, and new. Um, and even though I, I, was, I was doing some of it, you know, I, I really got a lot from it. And when I started to implement it more, and I don't subscribe to any one way of doing things. I just don't feel like in my role... Um, I don't have to, and I, and I don't necessarily want to only do one thing. So sometimes it's a compilation of, you know, lamp a method and, you know, a different kind of method. But um, I do see a lot of success with it, and it does really change the way. Um, I've also see, I've seen it really stick with some, uh, some, some new professionals, um, really click with them. And like I said, we have a program, um, an autism program in, within our co-op, and we do have a lot of students um, and some who I think people didn't think that, you know, an advanced device would be possible for them or appropriate for them. And they're really showing that, that it is working. Um, the one thing I get held up sometimes is I, we have a great startup. Um, and you might have a great, you know, but that middle part is sometimes still hard to try to. And I've talked to John Halloran, who um, is the, uh, our main guy with LAMP, you know, and kind of saying, okay, you know, you show me how to get started and you kind of show all these accessories, but what about that middle part? You know, help me bridge, you know, but I'm, I'm working it through. I'm working it out and, and I'm seeing, I am seeing a lot of success. And not just with kids with autism, but with, you know, kids with Down syndrome and, and kids with all different uh, disabilities. And say what that stands for again? Um, language acquisition through motor planning. Okay. And so can you give me an example of how they use that on their device? Um, well, for example, um, Frankie company, like, let's say you have a device and they use the Unity language system, um, and what you might have is, like, let's say 60 or 84 symbols, and uh, you can get started by hiding almost, like, all the symbols, mm -hmm. um, even though they're all still there, you know, but they're hidden, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, let's say we're going to do more, you know, so they want um, to make the car, uh, they want more you know, the car to go more or something like that. They want more of something, so they hit more. And then you start unhiding the buttons and bringing them back. Ah, but okay. they're all still in the same place, so they're all there, you know. But they're not greeted with a, hu a huge selection. Right. Now, some kids can be greeted with a huge selection, and that doesn't, you know, but this is another way to do it. Um, and that the way that it's set up is that it's boop, boop, you know, eat, boop, boop, and sleep, you know, and it's the same pattern, you know, so it's always this. And they get, you know, and you can see that they hit this button. You can see their hand already going up to where it's going, where the next mm. symbol is, is going to be. Okay. Um, because the way the, the language is laid out, um, it's, it facilitates that. I don't know if that, it, it's easier to show you with a device, I guess. <laughs> um, no, that makes sense. Or to, makes see sense. It, to see it in therapy. But it's just this idea of, of you know, you can start with um, just a few words and build them back, but things are staying the same versus... Okay, we're on a page with four, now we're on a page with eight, and that symbol used to be here, but now it's over here, and, you know, and some kids, that doesn't bother them. I've had kids, oh, yeah, I don't care where you put it, I can do it, mm -hmm. you know, but some that, that it really makes sense to them, because sometimes it's not about what the symbol looks like, it's about where it's located, just mm -hmm. knowing that this is where I make this motion for eat, or I make this motion for go. Okay. You know. Yeah, so it's muscle it's, memory. Yes, and well. it's very cool when you see that motor plan, and you can see it, you can see them do that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. My name is Betsy Hogan. I'm one of the graduate students here in the um, Communication Disorders Department. And for instance, for me, going ahead looking for a job, um, mm -hmm. how do you, or with someone who hasn't had a lot of experience with AAC device as a professional, where do you start? How do you know um, this is the grant that I need to write, or this is who I need to contact in order to get this information to know where do I go from here? Because I have a student who needs this. Oh, that's a great question. So if you, you know, if you've decided um, that you have a student who needs it, that's great. That's a, that's a good first step, you know, because I think a lot of times, um, you know, that part is even missed. Like they just don't think that any of their kiddos could benefit from it. Um, and then, you know, I would, 
you know, if you can, depending on where you work, you know, seek out, you know, find out, is there somebody in our, our district that helps with that? Or is there another SLP, you know, at the middle school or at the high school who's, who's done that before um, to help? But then um, also those regional consultants can, can be a resource to find out, you know, how does this all work? Um, I can also give you my card, <laughs> then you just call me and I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll walk you through it. Um, because it is a process to get a device funded, um, and to go through the evaluation, you know, the reports are written in very specifically because insurance companies demand that certain things are in them. Um, and then, you know, it's a whole packet of, of, of you know, the client information form and a release of benefits form and a trial form. You know, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, so it is helpful to have somebody to walk you through the process. So see if there's someone, you know, locally within, you know, your district who can help or if there's a co-op that has someone. Um, but I, then I would check some of the the big companies and, and see if um, their consultants can come out. And I think that usually the, they're nice enough, they're going to tell you, you know, if you said, and now is there another company? They'll, I hope that they would at least say, yeah, there's, you know, we have this other person who, you know, there's another regional consultant in your area so that they can help. But, you know, what you need to do is be strong, though, and don't let them necessarily push, not that they are very pushy, but don't let them push their device on you. You want to try m multiple devices because I've had some people who are, well, we just knew about Dynavox. So we just went with the Dynavox and it's like, oh, there's so many more. Not the Dynavox, it certainly is great too, but you want to make sure that um, you try several different, and I think that would be important to know too, don't, you know, to, to contact several different places to get, um, to get trials. Um, in Missouri, they might also, ha if you stay in Missouri, like Illinois has a um, assistive tech loan program that you can get devices loaned to you for free, and I think Missouri probably has something similar to that. Um, so that you know they could be a resource to contact on how you know how do I get a trial um, at no cost you know so that's another idea too or your university I guess <laughs> your old alma mater any, any other, other questions? questions all right well I want to thank you all for joining us today and our, our viewers at home I feel like I should say I'll be right by that's watching this as a webinar here are some of the resources that Krista referenced. Do you want to tell us about any of these? Um, well, the first is just a book that um, uh, Buchelman and Miranda, I think their, their textbook is very good, um, although I'm sure my professor, Dr. Lyle Lloyd, would say his book <laughs> is also good. Um, uh, this one is a little more recent, so um, I included that. I find it to be a good resource. It's definitely on my shelf at, at work. Um, ASHA, uh, obviously our um, our Speech and Language, you know, Hearing Association. Um, that website is 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 great. Um, I'm involved in Special Interest Group 12, which is um, for AAC. Um, AACinstitute.org. I, I added that. Um, it has great res resources for professionals, but also like a family corner, and they have some contributors who are parents. Um, PracticalAAC.org is another website where um, some very good um, clinicians. Um, in AAC are providing um, great um, articles and um, materials and, and, and lots of different things on that one. And then this, this gal, I, don't, I wish I knew her personally, Lauren Enders, but I liked her on Facebook and Pinterest and, and they're just a constant influx of resources and information and materials and um, I mean I, I really got lost on her, her Pinterest board because there's just so much information there. Um, and you know she's also an SLP and uh, very into AAC and assistive tech. So you know if you if you like her on Facebook or Pinterest, you'll have a lot of resources there. And I think that's also um, maybe more uh, comfortable for maybe families and parent you know parents to to do something that's more social media um, than like a textbook. So. And that's why I loved it that when Krista gave me these resources, she's like, "Is it okay that I put Pinterest on there?" And I think it's great to have everything from a textbook to social media because you know parents aren't going to go let me sit down with this <laughs> textbook tonight and learn yeah. about you know but scooting around on Pinterest sure why not yeah so. oh, good. and then the last resource that I want to give everybody is Krista's email address mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> she I sometimes refer to her as an AAC missionary um, <laughs> she wants to go out and spread the word um, so, you know, especially for graduate students, I think you brought up an excellent issue there. When you get out into whatever school district you're working in or if you're working in um, 
you know, a hospital or a residential setting, you know, to think, okay, this child needs a device, or this adult needs a device, but I don't know what to do next. It's nice to have a person that can, you know, maybe put you on the right path. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're having trouble getting people to buy in and you just need a little pep talk, mm -hmm. this is the gal to go to. Definitely. And I'm happy to, you know, send anybody an email, you know, to, to get them in the right direction or, you know, to be a, uh, you know, just a shoulder to lean on, <laughs> uh, cry on, whatever it needs to be. But um, I certainly love to spread the word. So. All right. Well, that concludes our webinar. Thank you to everyone who attended or who is now viewing this online. And thank you to Krista Davidson. Okay.